Well, thank you for joining us for Celebration Online. We're glad to have you with us today as we continue our One Heart series through John chapter 17. In fact, I want you to take your Bible or your Bible app at this time and turn with me to John chapter 17. I want to remind you that there is a study guide at webcc.info that you can download right now to utilize to follow along with today's message. And by the way, the scripture passage is also at the top of that study guide. Uh, we've chosen the theme One Heart for our sermon series at this time because we know there's a lot of division and hostility in our world, especially as we approach our upcoming national elections. Now, although I, I love my country and I have strong feelings about politics and although I vote every chance that I get, uh, I don't engage in politics either on social media or from the platform in sermons. Here's some reasons why. One, I, I frequently share the gospel with people who are Democrats or Libertarians or Independents or Republicans. And I don't want anything uh, that I say or post or do to hinder my opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with people. Also, I minister to people who are Democrats and Libertarians and Independents and Republicans. And I don't want anything to affect my ability to minister to people. I have friendships with people who are Democrats and Libertarians, Independents and Republicans. And I certainly don't want to hurt or hinder those relationships. I also preach weekly to people who are Democrats and Libertarians, Independents and Republicans. And I don't want anything I say or do to hinder people from hearing and receiving the Word of God. I also want people to know that while I'm a loyal American, my greater loyalty is to God and to the Kingdom of God. I don't want politics to obscure for myself or for others uh, the fact that I am a follower of Jesus Christ and my greatest loyalty lies with the kingdom of God. I'm called as a preacher of God's word, not to be a political spokesperson or political strategist or uh, even a political commentator. I'm called to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to proclaim the good news of Jesus to people. I'm first and foremost a Christian. I'm a child of God. That's my identity. And I don't want politics or any political party or any political leader try to help help define who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. He's a hero that I worship, not any political leader, political party. He's the one that I worship. He's the one I follow. He's the one that I've given my allegiance to. And uh, I also am a member of a local church. A diverse group of people united in our love for Jesus. We all come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, uh, different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, different political persuasions, all those kinds of things. But we've come together to serve one God, uh, to build the kingdom of God, to, to be unified together in our approach of impact in the world with the message and ministry of Jesus. So I don't deal with a lot of those kinds of things. In fact, if you post something political on one of my social media pages, I'll probably delete you right quick or delete what you say. Uh, if I do, don't take it personal. I've deleted lots of comments on my pages over the years because I want, I want people to know that what I'm all about is I'm all about Jesus Christ. And while I don't speak publicly about politicians or parties, I do frequently address issues that have political implications, but I address them uh, not from a political perspective, but from the biblical perspective. This is what God says about this issue or this principle or this practice. So, uh, and uh, by the way, I'm probably not going to talk much uh, with you about any kind of politics. Uh, I'm glad to sit down over a cup of coffee. I have a spirited and friendly discussion. I'm always there for coffee. I'm always there for discussion, uh, but I'm not going to do so on, on social media or other places. Now, while our world is reeling in division and hostility, God has called his people to be united, not to be divided, but to be united, to be, have one heart. In order to get there, we are studying the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. When Jesus prayed this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was uh, about to be arrested. He was about to be tried. He was about to be crucified. I mean, this was a, the pivotal moment, perhaps, in all of human history. And he knew that a time, great time of testing and hardship was coming upon his disciples, so, so he prayed. And he knew it would take a miracle for his disciples to survive what he was going to go through and what they were going to go through. And so he was praying for that and he was praying for them. And frankly, it probably will take a miracle to, uh, for God's church to hold together with one heart, with all that we're experiencing and going through and dealing with here in 2020. But hopefully you've discovered the Lord is still in the miracle working business. So we can believe for that and pray for it. He's done a miracle working. I heard about a man one time who's trying to smuggle some uh, tequila over from Mexico into the United States. He dressed himself up like a priest, thinking that would help him with the border officials. But he is actually stopped by a border official. Who, and the border official asked him, uh, asked him, Father, what do you have in those bottles over there? And so the guy said, uh, dressed like a priest, said, oh, that's holy water I'm bringing from Mexico into the United States. And the border official said, well, I, I at least have to taste the contents of one of those. So he tasted some. He said, uh, Father, this doesn't taste like holy water. This tastes like tequila. 
And the man lifted his eyes toward heaven and said, praise God, he did it again. <laughs> now, here's what I know. The same God who worked miracles in times past, throughout history, in your life and my life, he's still in the miracle working business. And God can enable us to stay united and to stay focused and to stay strong, regardless of all the crazy things that are happening around us. Now, let's learn about that today from the Word of God, from John chapter 17. Here's what Jesus said in John 17, beginning in verse 6. He says, I have revealed you, Heavenly Father, to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you. You have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now, I'm departing from the world. They are staying in the world, but I'm coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name, but now protect them by the power of your name, so they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost, except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Now, Lord, speak to us today by your word, by your spirit, through this messenger, and help us to know how to stand strong in the face of adversity and difficulty and even hostility. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, in John 17, uh, Jesus is praying for his first century disciples, the ones he was leaving behind. But he was also praying for his 21st century disciples as well. Uh, we know that because later in John 17, 20, Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe me through their message. Now, we're going to unpack that in just a couple of weeks. But for now, let's take a moment to recognize uh, we are blessed when others are praying for us. Would you agree with that? We're blessed when others are praying for us. Uh, but we're even more blessed when the Son of God is praying for us. And the Bible says the same Jesus who was praying for his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane is still praying for us today. It says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Even at this moment, Jesus is speaking to the Heavenly Father on our behalf. And one of the things that the Lord prays for is that his people will stay strong when they're dealing with all kinds of adversity, and they would stay united when they're dealing with all kinds of hostility. Now, in John 17, he's also praying this. He's praying for his people to be blessed, his people to be protected, his people to be encouraged, and his people to be utilized by God. How many of you want to be blessed? Let me see your hand. How many of you want to be uh, protected? How many of you want to be encouraged? How many of you want to be utilized by God? Well, this part of Jesus' prayer is certainly for you. So let's learn what he's teaching us. To begin with, uh, becoming effective members of God's team requires having the right foundation. Having the right foundation. Now, if you've ever been to a Saints game or an LSU Tigers game or something like that, you'll see lots of people wearing home team jerseys. They'll be wearing jerseys, but they're not a part of the Saints team. Uh, for years, I used to wear jerseys when I would travel, get on Southwest, and somebody would sit beside me because they thought I was a Saints player. They wanted to talk to me. They should have looked at me and known I wasn't a Saints player right there. Uh, but they would sit down beside me, and I would use it as an opportunity to witness to them and share the gospel with them. But I, here's what I've discovered. A lot of people who dress like Saints players aren't really Saints players. And a lot of people who act like Christians and talk like Christians and even go to church like Christians are not real Christians. And Jesus is kind of separating that out here in this prayer. He's identifying those who are really his followers and those who are not. He listed some key identifiers of those who are on his team. First of all, Jesus explained that real Christians have believed that Jesus was sent by the Father. Now, in his prayer, he describes in reverse order some characteristics that identify his people as real, as real disciples. He says in verse 8, they believe you sent me. Now, we believe in a world, we live in a world where lots of people believe in God. They may believe in our God or they may believe in some other God, like the Muslim God or, or the 300 million Hindu gods or some other gods. But uh, most people I know of believe in God. Uh, they believe there is a God. Uh, now, even the people who say they don't believe there is a God, I say that because they already are the God of their life, or they want to be the God of their life. And what's amazing to me is how quickly those same people turn to our God when they go through a crisis or challenge or difficulty in their life. I think about a man one time who was in Africa and uh, he, he was uh, marching through the bush there and he fan, came across a lion and he turned to run, which you shouldn't ever run from a lion, and he tripped and fell and hit his head on a stone, knocked himself out. When he awoke, the lion was crouched over him. Now, this guy was an atheist, said he never believed in God, but at that moment he became a real believer. 
And he prayed for the first time in his life. He prayed, God, you know, you know, I've never believed in you, but right now I need your help. And then he prayed the first thing that came to his mind. He said, God, if you're really there, would you turn this lion into a Christian lion? And he looked up and saw the lion actually bow and put his paws together like it was praying. He thought, man, this is happening. And then he heard the lion pray. And the lion said, Lord, thank you for this food you have prepared for me this day. <laughs> now, here's the thing. A lot of people believe in God. Even people who say they don't believe in God, they're always angry at the God they don't believe in. But it's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to believe in Jesus. To believe in God means that you believe in a power that creates. To believe in Jesus means that you believe in a person who cares. To believe in God makes a person a deist. To believe in Jesus Christ makes a person a Christian. And the Bible says that real Christians are people who have a deep devotion to Jesus Christ. Listen, you can go all over the world. People are willing to talk with you about God. But when you bring up the name Jesus... Then you find out who really wants to know about Jesus, who wants to be a follower of God, who is a follower of God. We Christians believe that Jesus is the only Son of God and the only Savior of the world. Uh, he's the one we have to turn to for having forgiveness for our sins, freedom from our strongholds, and the future of heaven. One time Jesus had to address this with his disciples. He asked, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, they say you're this person, or that person, or this person, or that sort of person. But then Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Uh, Peter's response reminds us that nothing we believe about life is more important than what we believe about Jesus Christ. I can say that because of what unfolded next in Peter's conversation with Jesus. Jesus said, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, you're Peter, which means a small rock. But upon this rock, this big rock, myself, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. And let me tell you, the difference between Peter, the fisherman and Peter, the great leader of, of God's work was the fact of his total devotion to and belief in Jesus Christ. So Jesus explained real Christians have believed that, that, that he was sent by the Father. They have also accepted Jesus' message, he says in verse 8. He says, For I passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from... You know, what was the message exactly? It was a message that he had come to be the Savior of humankind. That he had come to bring help, hope, and healing to other people. That he had come... Uh, and by the way, he came to bring salvation and help, hope, and healing, not just to people who look like us, or not just to people who act like us, or not just people who, love, who vote like us. He came to bring help, hope, and healing, and salvation to every person on the planet. In fact, Jesus said this as he began his ministry in Luke 4. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now, I'm going to address that verse more next week, but uh, here's what we know from these verses. Jesus alone can meet our spiritual, emotional, relational, and physical needs. Jesus alone. In fact, that's the heart of the gospel. Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed. And he came to bring the Lord's favor to anyone and to everyone. Now, some of you may not identify with some of those uh, physical and tangible conditions, but they are spiritually true of us all. We are all spiritually destitute before Jesus becomes the Savior and Lord of our lives. Uh, we're all captives to some struggle or stronghold before Jesus becomes the Savior and Lord of our lives. We're, we're all blinded to some degree in our minds until Jesus becomes the Savior and Lord of our lives. We're all oppressed by this, that, and the other, by obstacles and opposition in our lives until Jesus becomes the Savior and Lord of our lives. Now, the, th the thing is, lots of people in our world, they'll look to self-help books or self-help gurus or all those kinds of things. Listen, the answer to our needs is always found in the person and power of Jesus Christ. Jesus said real Christians have accepted his message. He also explained that real Christians have determined that everything good is from the Lord. It says in John 17, 7, Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. Let's break down that statement for a moment. Start with the latter part. Everything I have is a gift from you. Everything is a word that tends to be pretty inclusive. It comes from the Greek word panta. It's related to the word pantheism, which is the non-biblical belief that God is in everything. That God is in possessions and money. and He's in gifts and talents and abilities. That God's in anything and everything. Uh, but here's what Jesus is saying. Everything that is good, not everything, but everything that is good is a gift from God. We're to treat every good thing. Every good relationship, every good moment as a gift from God. In fact, in the former part of the statement, Jesus says, now they know. When you, when you realize that everything and everyone good that is in your life is a gift from God, it changes how you perceive people, how you interact with people, and how you follow God in your life. And by the way, even some of the most difficult people in our lives can be good gifts to us. Have you ever discovered that? 
Uh, if you have a parent who disciplined you, they were, they were a good gift from the Lord for you in your life. If you have somebody that you uh, really have some conflict with at work, it may be that God's put them into your life to be like sandpaper in your life, to help you become a better person in your life. Uh, so treat them as a gift from the Lord. Now, once we determine everything good is from God, then we become godly managers of the resources, our opportunities, our, and our time. And then Jesus explained that real Christians have kept God's word. He says in John 17, 6, they were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now, the word kept here means to closely guard or watch. It implies diligence and care to accomplish something. Yeah, I can remember there are times when my wife and I have been painting in our houses. Anybody ever, uh, ever had to paint in your house, you know? And so when you get ready to paint, you put drop cloth on the floor, especially if you have carpet, put drop cloth on the floors and you cover it. And then, when you, then you go to great lengths to make sure you don't get paint on everything. And then when we finish, we go to great lengths to avoid uh, stepping in the wet paint and tracking it all over the carpet. In fact, you find yourself moving around like highly trained ninja assassins just to make sure you keep everything uh, there good. That's how we're to be with God's word. We're to keep it and guard it and be real attentive to it, with it. That's also that word kept there is a mariner's term. Uh, back in uh, Jesus' day, back in John's day, uh, people, uh, mariners steered their ships by the stars. Now, sometimes they would get blown off course. Sometimes they would lose their way. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, they, they would uh, have problems that would cause them from being where they wanted to be or doing what they wanted to do. But, but they, then they would realign their ships with the stars. And what Jesus is saying here, what the Bible teaches, is that you, as a real Christian, you may get blown off course at times by the conversations with others, by the confusion of the world, by the circumstances of life, by the difficulties of life. But if you're real Christian, you'll get right back on track with the principles and practices of God's word because you want to keep God's word because you're a, a child of God. Amen? Amen. Now, here's what we find. In a chapter where Jesus spends a lot of time praying for the unity of his people, he actually recounts the identifiers first uh, those, uh, those on his team. It's a reminder to us that unity can only be found when we're all devoted to the Lord and to his truth. Now, what Jesus has laid out in these statements are the foundation of unity. And, and, and by the way, if we're really honest, uh, uh, political elections challenge the unity of God's people. They test our values. That being said, I'd like to share some biblical values that all Christians ought to be able to rally around during this Christmas season. Some truths from God's word we should consider as we prepare to vote in the upcoming elections are that God wants us to support initiatives and platforms that seek to protect and preserve human life. In other words, God uh, wants us to protect life in the womb, but all the way to the tomb as well, as Dr. Tony Evans said. We're to care about babies before they were born, but we're to care about children after they're born, and teenagers after they're born, and others after they're born. We're to care about everybody. We all, as Christians are called to protect and preserve life. We're to be not just pro-birth, we're to be pro-life all the way, all the way. And then God wants us to support initiatives and platforms that support the understanding that marriage is a commitment between a man and a woman. There's been a lot of debate this week about that. There's been a political, uh, there's been a spiritual leader who's made commentary about that. But I, I, let me tell you, I have friends who embrace uh, different values than I do and live different lifestyles than what the Bible affirms. But while I can communicate with them and treat them lovingly, I've got to stand where the Bible stands that marriage is for a man and a woman under the authority of God in their lives. I actually had a friend who posted on social media uh, who's chosen to live in a different kind of lifestyle. And he said, who in the world said that a man has to be married to a woman? And, and I responded back, Jesus said that. And uh, in Matthew chapter 19, and somebody responded, now you've been dentist. I don't know what being dentist means, <laughs> but I hope it means I'm calling people back to the word of God. We also need to know that God wants us to support initiatives and platforms that address the needs of the poor and ensure access to education for everyone. Let me tell you, if you read the Bible and you really read the Bible, you'll discover God really cares about the poor. They're dear to his heart. He wants us to care about them as well. In fact, he, he wants us to be more focused on helping the poor than garnering possessions for our own selves and our own lives. The Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? In Matthew 25, Jesus said, at the end of time, we're going to be judged by what we did for the hurting and the needy, for the, the least of these, for the poor. And by the way, the Bible says, if you help the poor, you lend them to the Lord and God pays back good measure. Let me tell you. 
And then God wants to support initiatives and platforms that oppose unjust discrimination and pursue justice for all citizens and immigrants. Let me tell you, there are probably 100 verses in the Bible that say, says you got to take care of the widow, the poor, the orphan, and the foreigner among you. I don't have time to flesh all that out right now, but that's what the Bible says. God also wants us to support initiatives and platforms that promote peace in our nation and pursue peace throughout the world. He wants us to support initiatives and platforms that ensure full conscience protection and religious freedom. And he wants us to support initiatives and platforms that promote care for his creation. Now, political parties sometimes want to convince us that these are the issues that really matter, or these are the issues that really matter, or these are the issues. That really matter. But remember, politicians aren't prone to always telling the truth. In fact, even the best of politicians don't tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth all the time. I heard about a man who died and went to heaven. And when he got to heaven, he saw big clocks all over heaven. And he asked St. Peter, what are these clocks for? And he said, well, they represent every person's life. And every time they tell a lie, one, uh, one minute ticks off their clock up here in heaven. He, saw, he said, well, look, up, where's my clock? And he saw his clock read 3.15. He had been doing quite a bit of lying in his life. He asked for his parents' clock. His, his dad's was 4.21. His mother's was 2.17. She had told less lies than his dad. He took an interest in the clocks of noteworthy people, entertainers and all those kinds of things. And, and, and their clocks are moving forward as though keeping real time. That's what was happening right there. But he looked around for some of the political leaders and couldn't find their clocks. And, and St. Peter said, well, the, the, the clocks of political leaders, we keep them in the back and use them for fans because they go around so fast right there. Listen, I met a handful of politicians I think are sold out for the Lord who strive to tell the truth much of the time, most of the time. But my faith is not in any political leader or any political. My faith is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the Bible, in the Word of God. And if we're going to be like who Jesus has called us to be and live like He's called us to live, do what He's called us to do, that's got to be our priority as well. Amen? Amen. And then becoming effective members of God's team requires not only having the right foundation, but enduring lots of tension. Now, this is a season of tension. It's particularly true for Christians. Why? Because Team Jesus, how many of you are on Team Jesus right now? Team Jesus is a diverse team, and diverse teams experience tension. Now, tension is a little unpleasant, a little uncomfortable, but it's not always bad. In fact, sometimes tension can be good. When you drive your car, you want good tension on the belts that turn your engine. You want there to be good tension in your axles and, and steering columns so the wheel doesn't pull to one side. When you lay on a bed, I mean, you like, may like a soft bed, but you want there to be some springs with some tension underneath that. So it's not like laying this on a soft uh, rug on the floor. Uh, tension is a necessary thing. When we run away from tension, the results can be catastrophic. So, so here's what we find here. God's church experiences tension because we are residents of earth, but citizens of heaven. We're residents of earth, but citizens of heaven. In verse 9, Jesus prays, My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. Now, later on in this chapter, John, Jesus is going to talk more about the world. Uh, but it was stuck in John's mind through his gospel and letters. John describes the tension of people who are in the world, but not of the world. You see, the Bible says for Christians, this world is not our home. This nation is not our home. Uh, Paul wrote these words in Philippians 3.20. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Now, let me tell you, it's good to... Be grateful for your nation. It's good to live in a nation that's pretty safe and secure. It's good to live in a nation where, uh, where, where people have rights and freedom. Uh, not every nation has that, by the way. Not every nation has that. It's, but we need to remember, uh, but let me remember that no nation can compare to the kingdom of God. And we need to remember our citizenship is in heaven. We need to be concerned about elections, but we need to remember that we are citizens of a greater nation. We are governed by the greatest, most powerful, most benevolent leader there ever was. We need to remember that we have assurance of his, his protection and his provision. We're living in this world on a passport. That's what we're doing. Because our real citizenship is up in heaven. And by the way, uh, because we're citizens of heaven, we have access to the most benevolent judge there ever was. The most, uh, access to the most benevolent leader there ever was. We have a book of the most righteous laws and decrees. And by the way, if we ever mess up, which we all will, uh, we live in a kingdom where there's always forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration. Here's the point. The politics of this world aren't worthy of our heart's allegiance, but the kingdom of God always is. God's church experiences tension because we're residents of earth, but citizens of heaven. We also experience tension because we are born free, but slaves to God. Born free, but slaves to God. Now, we all want to be free. Everybody wants to be free. Some people want to be more free than others, but we all want to be free in our lives. But freedom works a little differently in the spiritual world. In the Old Testament, Joshua told the Israelites they had to choose who their master would be. 
He said, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose the day whom you will serve. Would you prefer to serve the gods of your ancestors, your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we're going to be devoted to the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. To Joshua, a person could choose to serve the Lord, or they could choose to serve other pagan gods. But there was no opting out out of serving. There was no opting out of having a leader or a master. Uh, there's no fighting for your dependence. We always wind up serving something or someone. Now, God has given us all free will, but we all wind up serving something or someone. It could be the devil. It could be the world. It could be our flesh. It could be pagan gods. Uh, it could be anything and anyone. Uh, here, but here's what, we, here's what I've discovered. It's a lot better to serve the Lord than to serve the devil or devilish people or even serve my own self. It's a lot better to serve the Lord. And we're to surrender our will to the Lord. Jesus talks about that in our passage. He says in John 17, 6, I revealed you, Heavenly Father, to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Here's what that tells us. That Jesus' disciples... We belong to the Lord. We no longer belong to ourselves. And so when I go to make a decision in life, whether it's a decision about something to buy or a decision about how I'm going to interact in a relationship or even a decision who I'm going to vote for, I've got to talk to the boss. I've got to talk to my master, Jesus Christ, because I belong to him. I belong to him. And then uh, God's church experiences tension because we are in harm's way, but without fear. Now, in life, we can make some really bad assumptions. One of those bad assumptions is that God wants you to be happy in this life. But that's not really true. God values your happiness, which is why he's prepared heaven for us, which is a place of eternal happiness. Uh, but this world is not about happiness. This world is about, uh, the, about character development. That's what we're about here, about character development in our lives. God wants us to pursue character development. Another bad assumption is that God, another bad assumption is to assume God always wants you to be safe. That's not in the Bible. There's no safety involved in Jesus' calling. There was no safety involved in the disciples' calling. In fact, only one of those disciples, only one of those dudes died of natural causes. Did you know that? They all uh, were followers of Jesus, but they all experienced tragic deaths. Listen, God is less interested in our happiness than He is in our holiness, and He's less interested in our safety than He is in our strength. Now, I know that may be concerning to you, but hold on for a moment. Look at what Jesus prayed in John 17, 12. He prayed, during my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Uh, those words of Jesus remind us that God hasn't called us to a place of safety, but he's promised to strengthen us so we can endure what we go through. He's promised to protect us. That's especially important right now. You know, a lot of people get caught up in the fear mongering of all the political scenes. Listen, don't ever Live by fear. Don't ever make a decision because of fear. Don't ever take a vote because of fear. I think it's a bad witness when Christians let fear determine what they do, what they say, how they act, even who they vote for in their life. We should never let uh, fear the political developments of our society because, listen, the Lord is still our protector. The Lord is still watching over us. I'm not saying we shouldn't fight for what we believe in and vote for what is right and just for the people of our nation. I'm just saying we should never be afraid. We should never fear those things because our welfare, our safety are never in the hands of some mayor or governor or senator or representative or even some president. Our safety is in the hands of the Lord who loves us and cares for us and has always promised to be there for us. John said, perfect love cast out fear. And we can live without fear, not because we love perfectly, but because we serve a one who always loves us perfectly. Oh, we don't have the power. You know, there's a lot of things we can't change. We don't have the power. We don't have much control over the coronavirus, do we? <laughs> I mean, we can do things that are right, but we don't have much control over the coronavirus. We don't have much control over the storms that come our way in the Gulf of Mexico. And, well, and we don't have the power. We're not going to have the power, a lot of power, to change a lot of things in our nation. But we do have the power to trust in the Lord and depend upon the Lord and walk with the Lord. And when we do, He's promised to watch over us and protect us and to guard us and to help us in our lives. It all comes back to trusting in the Lord. Tension is hard to deal with. It's uncomfortable. It's so much easier to stay away from the tension. But here's what I've discovered. When I've been working out, and you can tell I haven't worked out a whole lot, but when I've been working out... I've discovered it's that tension that helps build your muscles. It helps strengthen you. It helps make you better and stronger and healthier. And so sometimes we need tensions in our lives. But with so many tensions to manage, we need the Lord 
to strengthen us and hold us together. Then our passage read earlier, Jesus said, All who are mine belong to you, Heavenly Father. And you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. You know, honestly, I can't remember when there was a time when it was harder to bring the Lord glory. It's become so easy to say the wrong thing, to post the wrong thing, to like the wrong thing, to go to the wrong website. But we've got to be focused on bringing the Lord glory. And we bring the Lord glory uh, as effective members of His team by having the right foundation, the right beliefs and the right values, and by enduring lots of tension. At times, that feels almost impossible to me. I don't know about you, but almost impossible to you. Let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God answers prayer? Yeah. You believe God answers prayer? I do. I see Him answer lots of prayers. Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that God answers every prayer? Yeah. Every prayer. Some of you do. Some of you are not sure about that. It's a little tougher. You know, I prayed for things like I prayed for a Ferrari and God didn't answer that prayer. I've prayed to become fabulously wealthy and God didn't answer that prayer. That's a good thing, by the way. God doesn't answer every prayer that we pray. You know, if God had answered every prayer I prayed, I'd have been married 10 times before I met my wife, Vicki. Thank God God didn't answer all those prayers right there. Do you believe that God answers the prayers of Jesus? The answer has to be yes. But look at what he says in verse 11. Jesus said, Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so they will be united just as we are. Jesus prayed that we would be protected and that we would be united. Now, the joy of my life is to know I'm protected by the Lord. The goal of my life is to answer the prayer of Jesus and be united. One of the goals of my life to be united with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, not just for my life and for your life, but for the lives of people all around the world. Recently, I was in Kansas. If you ever go to Kansas, you'll see just wheat fields everywhere. And wheat fields don't look too dangerous, right? Wheat fields, unless you're a child, unless you're a child who's playing in the wheat fields. I mean, this past uh, weekend at Celebration Church, I uh, had a couple sitting there talking to me with one of the little boys, and one of the little boys decided to hide in the worship center. We spent the next 15, 20 minutes looking for that little boy. He was playing a game. He was hiding from us in the worship center. That wasn't funny. I'm telling you, that wasn't funny at all. <laughs> I heard a tragic story one time about how a little boy went to hide from his parents in the wheat field. And night set in, and they couldn't find him. It was cold. It was bitter cold. And so they were walking and calling his name. Couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. They got their neighbors together, and everybody was walking all over the place. Couldn't find him. Finally, uh, somewhere early in the, morning, in the morning hours, they joined their hands together and walked through those wheat fields. And together, they found him. But it was too late and his life had been lost. And I remember reading the caption below the photograph, and here's what the father said through tears. He said, if we had just only joined hands together, if we'd only joined our hands together beforehand, we could have saved his life. Here's the thing. We've got to join our hands together right now. Not only for our good, but for the good of others around the world, and most of all, for the glory of the Lord. Amen? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus. And we thank you that Jesus prayed for us and is praying for us right now. That we would be blessed, that we would be protected, that we would be encouraged, that we would be utilized, and that we would be united. Help us to, help us to do everything we can to build up unity in the body of Christ, not divide the body of Christ. And right now, with their heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you, are you a member of the body of Christ? Are you a member of the family of God? Do you, do you, have, do you sense the presence and peace and power of the Lord in your life? If you're not sure, I want you to pray with me. Just pray with me right now. Pray, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Thank you for leaving heaven and coming to this earth to be the Savior and Lord of my life. Please forgive me of my sins and change my life. Fill my life with your presence, your peace, your love, your joy with the power to change and to, and to work with others for the cause of Christ. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, in just a moment, we're about to participate in communion together. But before we do, I want you to go to webcc.info. Uh, go to webcc.info. Find the My Decision tab. And then I want you to download that. And if you pray with me to receive Jesus as your Savior, check off, I prayed with the pastor. If you want to recommit your life to the Lord, you can check that off. If you have some other decision, you let us know or some prayer request, let us know. 
And then we're about to participate in communion together. Thank you for joining us. Keep praying for us as we work together for the cause of Christ in our region and all around the world. Church family, one of the things that you can do to be unified as a body is to participate in communion together, to participate in the Lord's Supper together. Because when you come together and remember what Jesus did, it's easy to put aside your differences. And we're going to remember what Jesus did for us today in this time of communion. You know, on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he passed it around to his disciples and he taught them that that bread represented his body that was broken for them. And he said, whenever you eat this, remember me. In the same way, Jesus took a cup and he passed it around to his disciples and he taught them that the contents of that cup represented his blood that was shed for them. And he said, whenever you drink this, remember me. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you and we thank you so much for who you are. And we thank you for what you did for us on the cross, paying the price for the sins that we've committed, Father. Lord, as we come together and worship you today in this time of communion, draw us closer to you and closer together. Help us to remember what you did for us and how that price is worth us coming together. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. We hope today's sermon was helpful to you. For more resources related to this sermon, check out the Dig Deeper resources at the end of the sermon notes. If you need prayer, we would be happy to pray for you. Simply leave us a note about your prayer needs at webcc.info by clicking on the prayer request tab. For more information about our church, see celebrationchurch.org. Thanks again for joining us at Celebration Online.